Thanks so much for coming to our first um, Artists in Conversation se session um, featuring the artists from the Ilham Art Show. This week we are joined by artists Chong Yan Chua, Devinda Singh, um, Leon Leong, and Mr. Quick. Um, where the conversation will take the format of um, a tour um, and will be moderated by researcher, writer, and founder of Cloud Projects, an independent publishing house. And, um, and these talks will be uploaded online on our YouTube channel, Ilham Gallery KL. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Xiao. Hi guys, uh, can you all hear me? Okay, I'm gonna try to project my voice a little more because you know everyone's kind of far away. But welcome, thanks for coming. Um, I didn't quite expect so many people, and thanks, Kat, for the lovely introduction. But basically, you know, there aren't that many of us in relation to the normal sort of Ilham number. So what I'm hoping to do today is really just make an intimate space for us to kind of think together. Um, and obviously, you know, we all have the opportunity now to talk to the artists who are making the work, which is pretty special uh, for me as well. Uh, but I'm hoping today that everyone leaves with an interpretation of the work, right? Not mine, not the artist, but your own. And today's talk, I guess, it's sort of broadly themed around space and architecture, which we can use as kind of like guiding brackets. But, you know, some, some of these comparisons maybe are a little bit more direct. So, you know, let's say, why a house? Or like, what happens on the level of the content, right? Like, what is the artwork sort of picturing? But I think going down a layer deeper, what I really want to encourage everyone to think about is, you know, what is your position in relation to these works? So how does the idea of space present it, kind of tie up with what the artists are trying to say? You know, how does where we are, the gallery, inform our understanding of art and the sort of works that we are looking at? And what I want to try to do, and you know, everyone can try with me, uh, is to start building a kind of narrative thread, right? Let's make connections, make comparisons, and build our own kind of lexicon for knowing art, right? There's no one narrative truth and everyone's voices is valid here. So to that end, feel free to ask questions, to disagree, to just say things, you know, even if there's no question, you just wanna like, you know, raise your voice and kind of like share with the room. That's totally fine, totally welcome. Um, we also wanna try to do a bit of close looking, right? Since we can get up close and personal. So as we move and look at the work, you know, just really sort of examine what you're looking at, like what am I seeing in front of me, how would I describe this work, like what words would I use to kind of make sense of what's in front of me. Um, but this is a casual conversation um, and I'm really hoping that I don't have to talk for two hours straight, so please ask questions. Um, we'll move from Leon's work to uh, the vendors, then Chong Yen, and then we'll end with Minstrel's work. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Anyone have questions or concerns or anything? If not, we'll start. All right. All right, so welcome to Leon Leong's work, uh, The Floating World of Kampung Baru. So, Kampung Baru, if you don't know, is a small Malay enclave, which is just down Jalan Ampang, and you cross the highway with Saloma Bridge. Uh, it is actually a pretty historic area, so it was where the first Malay Congress was held uh, at Sultan Sulaiman Club and also where the May 13 riots in 1969 broke out. Uh, it's a sort of, sort of very interesting area because I think a lot of people today see it as a kind of rural kampung life in the middle of big city, right? So it's, it's romanticized quite heavily in that way. Uh, so, Leon's work was inspired by Indo-Persian miniatures uh, and it tracks about a hundred years of Kampung Maru's history, right? So, it traces the lives, the loves and the dramas of residents uh, from the story of the founding of Kampung Maru all the way to its sort of history in the late 20th century. And I think Leon's work especially really benefits from uh, a really, really close looking I think they're magnifying glasses there. So if anyone wants to sort of pull it up and look at the details there, I mean, it, it gets better the more you look at it, right? Uh, so, you know, there are paintings about floods. Um, there's, you know, one that depicts major historical events in the, re in the area, but my personal favorite is Progress of Love, which sort of tells the story of a multi-generational family in the kind of seasons of a use of a house. Um, and then it's all in this structure, right, which is modeled after the stilt homes that he depicts in his work. 
Um, and you know what I really see this work doing is sort of speaking to this entangled truth of time and history and capital that all kind of come together. Uh, so yeah, feel free to walk around. I am going to start by asking Leon a question, and you guys can you know you don't have to just look. You know, feel free to just interact with the work. Um, but yeah, so Leon. Okay. So Kampung Baru has <laughs> often been said to be lost in time, right? And this is something that we, we talked about quite a lot as well. And um, recently, there's also been a Malay heritage park that's been proposed. So 11 silt homes are going to be sort of put together in a preservation district, quote unquote. So you've mentioned that we must think beyond this preservation, right? Think beyond the kind of like house as a unit. Um, so how do you think your work stands in relation to that conversation? I think I, I, I take a step back. Um, I, I, this whole process, uh, more than almost two years kind of process, make me think about heritage. You know, how, how do we preserve heritage? It, it's not so much about this against that. You know, I mean, keep this old thing and you know, or, or, or use the new thing. Um, the whole process of this makes me think about. I think we are at a point in our life. I mean, especially this current time, it's it's about managing change. You know, I mean, managing new and old. It's not so much about one or the other. So in terms of heritage uh, park, which there are over 100 still kind of like uh, still houses in Kamong Baru. How do you choose the 11? You know what I mean? And who gets to be chosen and what represents? So that, that, that to me is not the ideal situation, but uh, I, I actually, uh, this is the second project that I've done dealing with this, you know, the housing and, and the heritage project. I, I, to be honest, I mean, I can't really tell you what is the answer. I think it, it, it takes all of us, you know, I mean, the, the city planner, the government, developer and everyone to, to take care of it. But ultimately for me, it's, I think we just have to be a lot more creative in dealing with change, in dealing with old and new. Um, what was the question again? Yeah, no, just general thoughts. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so basically, it's not so much of like, you know, I mean, hold back the old thing or, or do the new thing. I, I think we are a lot more smarter these days. I mean, there's so many information. There's so many different things. I mean, we see the way people plan city in Rome or in London and whatever. How do we manage it? I mean, how do we keep the old yet the, and have room for progress? Uh, that is what we should be doing. But I think what kind of proposed previously was, that, okay, let's just put all these things in one corner, let's just build. Um, might not be the best solution. It might be, I, I don't know. I mean, but for me, it's use our mind. Uh, and the way I go back 100 years is to let us know, because sometimes we, we, we lost. I mean, we are so close our present. I mean, we look at the internet, we look at all this information, people fighting and whatever, but we just lost sense of what is what kind of thing. Um, my first painting is called uh, The Origin of Place, what Kampong Baru is about. Um, I, I, it? Yeah, I, and I, I use the analogy, it's almost like the Mesopotamia, because it's actually sandwiched by two rivers. Mesopotamia basically means the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And Kampong Baru, in a way, it is like the beginning of a civilization, it's the Malay enclave, and it's over 120 years old. So in that sense, like, can we treat it slightly smartly than we were just, you know, okay. And because I think the place has a life of its own. I mean, not that we have to stick back to history, but by understanding slightly further from whatever we're seeing now, because seriously, we don't know what is what. I mean, we're, at this time, I mean, people who, if you talk to people who is 100 years old, he probably tell, oh, this place was like this because it, was, it used to be a, a drain here, it used to be a flood, that's why we built certain things here. But when we go in, it's like, okay, let's just build this thing, you know, because we don't understand the background. And basically, to, to make it simpler, basically, <clears throat> to understand the background, I think we can think, we can build better in that sense. It's a lot more sensible. Uh, that was a bit alluding to that. Yeah. Anyone have thoughts, you know, like, anyone have questions, etc.? What does the work make you feel? No feelings yet. All right, <laughs> never mind. Okay, one thing that I really find interesting about the work is that, you know, with miniatures, there's this sort of alternation in perspective, right? You have the big picture, you have kind of what's happening as a whole, you have the composition as a whole, but then you really like have to look closely at what's happening in the specifics, right? Like I don't know, you mentioned to me that 
uh, in progress of love, you know, maybe if someone who spots it can get a prize. There's a circumcision that's happening in the house. I think uh, it's quite obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too, but you know. Uh, so, I mean... Yeah, I think, I think mm -hmm. like, if we love the place, if we love our heritage, if we love something, you, you, you look closer and you look closer and you look beyond what is now and what is before and also and be, knowing the past, you can do better for the future. I think it's just being, and, and part of the miniature, I, I want people to look closer. At the same time, I want to pack so much into one thing. So I, it, it, it's a, it's a so-called genre that I can put, you know, 120 years of, of uh, history, you know, past and present and f hopefully future in these seven paintings. I mean, if you go too long, you become an encyclopedia or whatever, nobody's going to read it either. So uh, that, was, that was part of the, one of the reasons. No? Yeah, so I guess I also want to ask you about the structure, which yeah, is a sort of still house, but painted in this very millennial pink. You think millennial? Like... I, thought, I thought it's quite kampong also. Really? Oh, okay, <laughs> great. So maybe there's a little bit of overlap there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, to me at least, it speaks to this kind of floating world, right? It's a coded neutrality. It's a neutrality of cafes, of, like, of Instagram. Uh, but maybe you have Some a different Some of the Malay house are actually yeah. quite colourful, mm. right? I mean, they use this bright blue, they use also this pink and that green, the turquoise green. Uh, again, I mean, it's oh and new, precisely what you're saying, there's a neutrality. I mean, depends how you see it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's always new in the old and the old and the new kind of... Why specifically did you choose to replicate a stilt house, though? Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted something to hold this thing together. I mean, I think painting um, and also partly Given this particular uh, project, I think uh, Ilham has this space that I, I can make use of. Uh, the, the, it, it builds an immersive place where you can experience so-called the kampong at the same time looking at the painting. I think it adds to it. And I want to showcase, uh, in this particular case, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with, I mean, the Malay Tangkam is a very uh, wonderful craft that, is, uh, that speaks about old knowledges, you know, heritage and culture and whatever. And they, they assemble in such an ingenious way that uh, you can disassemble it. And of course, we have seen like Usong Rumah where people can carry, you know, you take down the, the, the little bits and pieces, the structure can be moved. Um, again, that, that plays into the whole idea about um, heritage and, and culture and whatever and, and the old knowledges yeah. and um, this was quite honestly we tried to stick to this thing so this thing can be disassembled and assembled again and we didn't use any nails uh, or screw just to assemble this thing so it's quite tough <laughs> to, to build it it takes seven of us or eight of us to really just pasang you know because you need everybody to stand uh, at the corner but I think uh, that was the challenge Inspiration I'm going to start saying again Questions? Oh. Thoughts? Okay, so I'll speak to the mic. Yeah. So I guess I just want to say that I like the inspiration by the Tigris and the Euphrates in a painting. I think there's something that looking at the painting, I would not necessarily be able to point it out myself. So that's it. Yeah. I, I think Kampong Baru, it's... If you guys are in KL, you probably had been to Kampong Baru one time or the other. But most people go there to Makan, you know, I mean, the, the main Waisikai, the main street that we Makan and a few other places. But we don't really know Kampong Baru. I mean, it's such an amazing place and so much history in it. But at the same time, it's also very complex because if you don't get down from your car, you would never really know Kampong Baru. Kampong Baru is made out of seven sub-villages. Anyone knows that? Not even one of you guys. <laughs> you know, if, and, and these seven sub-villages are some from Jav uh, Javanese, and I mean, they call Java, and then Malaccan, Minang, and uh, some other uh, people. So, in the old days, when it first started as an agricultural settlement, these seven villages, you can't, your parents won't even allow you to cross the street to the other village to marry somebody over there. They want to keep the uh, identity, which is, I mean, this is a bit, maybe a bit exaggerated, but it's. Uh, it's how interesting it is. And even now, if you go want to Makan Nasi Padang, you have to go to that part which is more authentic because that part is actually where the Minang people originally from. But now, of course, it's all mixed up, you know. But understanding all this thing, let me see a better way of what come about. And, and what you said about, um, I think there's so much in it. I want people to, hopefully through some little pretty picture and colourful picture, people want to start looking at it and uh, part of the reason we also open up this area so that you can walk in 
because we always skirt around Kampung Baru and look at it like what you said about being nostalgic, this Kampung thing, and then I just move on kind of thing. I, I actually wanted people to look closer. I want to pick up on a little thing that you said, which is this idea of the pretty picture. Right, and, and this is something that we've talked about as well. You know, you used to make very sort of hyper-realistic work. And I think with this series, you're really shifting the way in which you're depicting people, you're depicting space. So, you know, what, what's the politics of the pretty picture for you? You know, like, what's the point of your You mean this is pictures? not as pretty as I, what I did earlier? No, it? I think it's prettier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's so pretty that my hand actually almost, uh, I almost break my wrist uh, painting it. But um, I, I think it, the difference between visual arts and uh, let's say literature or whatever, you know what I mean? Because literature, you just can't, you, you have to read the whole bloody book in order to get it. But pictures, you can just at a glance, you get quite a bit from it. Um, and my friend who is in film, I mean, for him, it's like, of course, you want to do your philosophical thing, you want to do your craft, but beyond which, some of us feel like there should be this layer which is a slightly more of a pop layer for people to at least get interested in. And ultimately, I'm not only talking to like this, you know, this kind of art, real art people or whatever. I'm talking to, I want to talk to everyone so that there should be some kind of appeal in the beginning for people to say, oh, it's interesting, let me look further. If you kind of turn people off because of this kind of thing, uh, you, you lose some audience in the process. So for me, that first impression, ultimately it's quite a visual arts thing, you know, at least people would want to find out more. And I think, you know, that really speaks to this question that maybe we can all think about as we go through, it's like, what's the point of art, right? Um, and I, I guess I'm coming from a sort of more general audience, right, like there, there is a sense in your work that you want to reach out to new people, there's a kind of activism, would you say that? I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit too early. <laughs> but uh, I suppose, yeah, la, I mean, um, for me, visual arts, it's just one part of what I want to do. I mean, I, I, it's more like an authorship, you know. I mean, there's some, something that I, I want to share. There's something that I want to connect. And ultimately, you know, uh, it's not so much of a self-expression. Ultimately, it's also about connecting with other people. I mean, humanity and, and things. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Whether it's activism or not, uh, I don't consciously seek that, but uh, I think it's in it. <laughs> no, but when you see something so nice, it's like, hey, please come, 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 and you know, let's solve this problem. I mean, I, 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 right now, I think, I think they say the, 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 the stars alignment is wrong or whatever. We were having so much, you know, the COVID and everything. It just like, how do we make something out of this thing? I, it's no point. Uh, I think the beauty has to come from us solving all, all this kind of problem, I suppose. Yeah. So uh, I also know that you're a writer. This is something that I know about you. Um, and I mean, I think for me also as someone who writes, right, it's very interesting to think about how you think about words and images differently. What's the line there for you? Like, do you think it's productive to think about them separately beyond a kind of like technical know-how? And I think, you know, what, what are the overlaps, right? When you're telling a story in images or painting versus in words? I think I was, if I were to look back at myself as a kid, I was the one who draw, not so mm. much of a writing. Uh, but I came to writing uh, because I was so fascinated with literature, you know, as the structure, the, the way to tell story. And my mother is a fantastic storyteller, so I think I get that a bit from her. Um, and I think I probably have told you that when I was a kid, you know, I said, oh, this is too easy for me, so I want to study more about literature and try about writing. So it, it goes back and forth, but ultimately I think it's just two different languages. One is a visual language, the other one is language. Yeah, I mean, if you do other things, if your film is a film language. So ultimately I think it's more about the authorship, you know, the, the, the way I... But what literature, what writing helps me, not so much about the... It, it just helped me, I mean, to, 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 to put a title to the thing, and the title comes back to guide me how else to uh, paint it better. I mean, I, there's a certain logic with words that visual arts might lack sometimes, you know, but then there's certain strength with visual arts where words couldn't quite express. So I think I, I go back and forth, sometimes I go crazy. <laughs> but one thing I find it really wonderful about literature and writing to me, it's, it's the way they structure the thing, to tell the full story. Um, I think a lot of the time when we paint, when we were 
doing visual arts, we paint one painting, it's like, wow, you know. But I think you could do that and that and that and all three ads together, the whole becomes bigger than the sum of the parts, if you understand what I'm talking about. It's very early. <laughs> so I, I, like to, I like to build something, you know, I mean, one plus one plus one bigger than three rather than just three, three different parts. So I think literature in that sense guide me. Um, I told, did I tell you, right? I think Milan Kundera, the, the way he structured his, uh, the unbearable likeness of being, you know, I mean, having the chapters, you know, in co according to symphony, you know, I mean, the fast pace, it was like, wow, you know, I mean, and I think we can kind of learn from different kinds of discipline and apply onto our things. So I think that helps me. Yeah, any questions, impressions? Yes. Hello, so I have two questions. Uh, why Kampung Baru? Sorry, very basic question. Why Kampung Baru? Is there a personal story, personal connection to it? Uh, the second thing is, uh, how were you informed by the activities that you, uh, that your art portrays? Uh, you know, did you have to like do interviews or again, personal story, did you grow up, uh, you know, like observing these things? Can you tell us a bit more about what your research process was like? Um, Kampung Baru, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm from Ipoh, but I came to KL, I mean, it's been like 20, 30 years. And then, I mean, you live nearby Kampung Baru and it's very interesting. I mean, you've been to Kampung Baru, <laughs> it's just such an interesting place. So that bit I can't really explain uh, other than it really interests me as, as an amazing place. And also maybe a bit of this so-called like, let just, let more people see it and hopefully we can, we, we can make it, make a better, you know, I mean, keep more of it kind of thing. Um, and I'm always interested about human in the lived environment. Uh, so that, that's my interest. I, I'm just curious when I was in Istanbul, like, I look at the people, oh, you look, I think you look in, you know, somebody from the Midwest and say, oh, how do you know? I said, like, you know, it's, it's, it's anthropology and this kind of space and then the city, how the city and the people, I mean, you change the city, the city changes you. Uh, I think that back and forth thing, just to make us a better person. I mean, ultimately, we, we, we are not living in isolation. Uh, I think that part interests me. And Kampung Baru present itself to me in that sense. It's such an interesting place and for me to also understand it better. The second question was uh, my process. Okay, yeah. Um, I work on this project a lot more earlier. I was under Ch Chandana's grant. Uh, so that uh, I was uh, there for like two months. Uh, I lived in Kampung Baru. And I, that time was, unfortunately, it was a bit COVID time, so I don't actually get to meet that many people because everybody, you know, I, even when you talk to people, it's like, ah, uh, kind of thing. They can't, I mean, they can't invite me to their house. My, old, my other projects earlier, I literally can go into their house, they even cook for me and whatever. So, but this one, it has a different, so I just walk along, uh, walk around Kamong Baru. I mean, and if you walk, right, beyond the main street, you know, I mean, you walk behind the alley and whatever, you see a different thing and people start to warm up to you when they see you a few more times. Um, in terms of research, that was mainly my research and a lot of reading. So basically this set of work, I mean, I'm, I'm, hand, I'm dealing with this hundred years of solitude, hundred years of <laughs> history. So I read a lot and then the research at Kampung Baru uh, placed me into the real time. So it's compared you know, back and forth, back and forth kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how, how, how have the people of Kampung Baru experienced your work? I haven't quite get a chance to talk to them yet. Uh, I, 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 I think we are still quite busy after the setup is still going on, but uh, I'll, I'll connect them more. Um, to be honest, I mean, it's such a, it's such a big place. Uh, so I think in my earlier work, I, I get to talk to, you know, I mean, the, the, the residents actually, I, I give them a painting of the other. But uh, this one, I think it's hopefully when I get a breather, when we all get a breather, they, they would see more of it. Uh, I, right now, I don't know exactly how their reaction is. Yeah. Sorry, actually my question was similar to, to his as well. I wanted to know the reactions, but I guess also maybe do you feel, I mean like since you've sort of like immersed yourself in the community, do you feel like they're a bit disconnected? from their, you know, like, uh, their roots, like where they came it's, from it's and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's quite complex, actually. And I think uh, being city folks, they are quite different from if you were to, ha to, to be in a different community. People are a lot more open. And I think they, I, I feel uh, they, un until they know you, 
they are slightly more guarded in a sense. Uh, they might look kampong, you know, the house, but they are just like every one of us. And because there's a lot of political issues, you know, whether to sell the land or keep the land, keep the house. So people that I don't know, they don't know which which side are you com coming from. You know, I mean, are you a journalist? You know, are you going to interview me? Am I going to get in trouble with whoever so and so kind of thing? So uh, it takes time. It takes time. Uh, so I think the two months was not that long. I, I still go back and forth, but I, I don't feel, I, I feel it's a lot more complex a situation where you need to talk to a lot more people, stakeholders. Uh, if you read the paper, there's a tendency of the paper trying to be citing the so-called, you know, I mean, over my dead body, even to take down my 100 year old house, you know what I mean? But there are people who I talk to, they say, it's okay, you know, I'll sell my house to move to a better place, you know what I mean? So this kind of issue is not something that, I want just people to start thinking and for them to think, you know what I mean? But it's quite divided, uh, it's almost political, so... Uh Actually, one thing that I found very interesting looking at the work and like thinking about these kind of politics, right? There's an enforced distance with the miniature. There's a kind of like outsiderness that is necessary in order to really picture the thing as a whole. Yeah, I, 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 I don't assume this important role of myself trying to mm. preach whatever. It, it's actually a thinking process. I mean, I, I take on most of the art project, most of my project to learn and to learn more rather to tell people what it should be. Uh, that, that's, I mean, I learned miniature along the way. <laughs> I'm self-taught with, with, with this whole process. So basically, it, I learned how to tell the story from miniature and I learned about Kampung Baru. I learned about my city, my people, you know what I mean? So, so that's the whole process. And what you feel hopefully is in the right direction. It might be in the wrong direction. I can't guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. All right. On that note, I think we can move on to the next work, which is Davinder's right over there. Davinder, everyone. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, oh, so yeah, okay. feel free to move into the hallway uh, if you guys can't hear. The work is here, uh, which we've all actually heard, so we're all deeply familiar. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this work by Davinder Singh here is entitled Jaga Life. Uh, Jaga, as we all probably know, is a very linguistically flexible word, right? So to care is the same as the one who is doing the caring. So this references his childhood growing up at a factory in Chan Chao Lin, where his grandparents were caretakers in a vertical saw milling factory. So before Malaysia became a net importer of security guards, right, from like Bangladesh and Nepal, etc., Jaga was really a kind of family endeavor. So, and especially among Sikh families, right, like the Vindas. So in, there was a kind of exchange that happens, an exchange for accommodation, a family would Jaga a factory. So it was performed by all ages, by all abilities. So it didn't matter if you were kind of like frail old women or like an eight-year-old kid, you were able to perform Jaga, right? There was no expectation for like having to be like combat prepared, you know, or like carrying a gun. Um, but I think what it really speaks to is this idea that presence is really all you need. Like you just need to be there. Uh, so. You might have seen on your way up from the ground floor, there was a charpoy, which is a kind of South Asian rope bit that was in front of the lifts. That is also part of the work, as well as this time recorder, which goes off at 11.15 and 6.15? 6.45. 6.45. So yeah, this mimics the time recorder in the factory that he grew up in. And the charpoy is actually his grandmother's own, which he has now represented in the context of the gallery. So the two kind of take turns, right? When the factory opens and the time recorder goes off, the charpoy is taken in, it's brought, it's sort of put away. And then when the factory closes, the charpoy is then brought out and then uh, sort of marked by the ring of the time recorder. So I guess, you know, I'll start with the first question, but as always, feel free to jump in, feel free to kind of give us your thoughts. So you and Leon, I think, both reference the kind of specific histories of a place, right? But your tactics, I think, are a little bit different. So where Leon really is focused on making images, right? One thing I've always found interesting about your work is that you're just making new configurations for old objects. Yeah, um, yeah. and I think there's a suggestion here that new forms are needed for new meaning, right? Uh, we just have to recontextualize them to imbue them with this kind of like cultural gravitas. Uh, to move them, you know, from the factory to the gallery. So I guess I wanted to ask you how you see these two places interacting with each other, the factory and the gallery. I think the contrast is pretty obvious, I think, from coming from a very gritty, dirty environment, you know, like, like a factory. Uh, yeah, 
Um, so I think the contrast is pretty obvious that um, previously, like the Chapoy and the Time Recorder was like kind of presented in a factory environment, you know, as what Sho said. Um, like for me, um, I think at the moment now, how it's been presented in, in a gallery is kind of like, it's the context of it kind of changes, the concept of it changes. But I think the idea of um, kind of caretaking is still there because I think I would say uh, the Chapoy kind of uh, represents that spirit of, uh, you know, being there, being present. You know, like, so there's a presence there. So even though there's no one there, but I think there's also a presence. So I think um, for the time recorder, I think as a child, so I used to be, uh, um, you know, I used to go to school in the morning and used to come back in the afternoon. And, but the time recorder kind of uh, shocked me every single time, like how you guys got shocked earlier. So, um, and I wanted to incorporate that in my previous show, which was in 2020, which was called Tagistan. So I think the whole idea kind of uh, developed from there. And I initially wanted to use the time recorder to kind of record people coming in and going out and viewing the show and how long you spent and all that stuff. So, but it didn't happen at that time because uh, I kind of didn't manage to find a similar type of uh, vintage time recorder, which was like the current time, time recorders are all made out of plastic. And, uh, quite di they're digital, so this is pretty much quite mechanical, very analog, which I kind of remember it kind of represents the similar one which is in the factory. And the siren, of course, uh, the factory one was way more louder than this. So, uh, of course, like as for an eight year old and you know, living in this uh, not so normal environment, you know, like uh, so that thing always kind of like reminded me like, oh, okay, it's going to go, the, the workers are going to go out for lunch or they're going to come back for lunch or they're going to go out for tea and stuff like that. So, and how, uh, why I wanted to put it here is because I actually wanted the audience, like the visitors to kind of interact with it as well. So, uh, there is like extra time, time cards, so which you can actually write and, you know, I wanted to have the similar feeling of you're coming in, you're clocking in and you're clocking out. So, uh, hence, Quite, yeah. yeah. Any thoughts, impressions? Did anyone ears like get permanently deafened just now? And the other thing is like at the moment, like current times, we record time, like you know, we kind of record time differently. If you go to work, you know, there's thumb prints and you know there's excess cards and stuff. But this is like kind of uh, reminds you of how things were, like, you know, prior, like maybe thirty years ago, forty years ago. Yeah, so going to work was like pretty much that would determine your salary, that would determine your overtime, that would determine everything. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, again, a lot of your works are about Chan Sao Lin, about yeah, your childhood, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I guess I wanted to ask you as well on a personal level, uh, why does it continue to hold meaning? But also on a public level, right? Like, why do you continue to make work about Chan Sao Lin for a kind of public, right? Like, what's... You know, of course, the two are very deeply tied together, but for you, what's the continued relevance of the story? I think it's because um, I was so close to my grandparents. I was very close to them, and I think they were like uh, pretty much my own parents because my mom was a single parent and she used to work during the day, and I think most of my time kind of was spent with my grandparents, you know, so they were there most of the time. And I wanted to kind of uh, bring back those memories again, like, you know, throughout my work, like, you know, my previous books as well. I've been collecting a lot of stuff over 10 years from around this area, Chan Sao Lin. So um, I think during the pandemic, I had that whole, that liberty of time and, you know, and that space, which kind of allowed me to bring all this stuff out and kind of think of what am I going to do with it and how am I going to curate this whole thing, um, you know? So um, I think the whole idea was just um, pretty much taking things out of storage and uh, putting it out and see what can you like do with it. Yeah, so mostly it's, uh, I think the, the, like how I've presented works is a bit um, kind of my, I don't know if you guys are familiar with my works, but uh, like my previous works were like quite two dimensional, they were paintings, more painterly, and it kind of depicted the interior space and the exterior space of an environment or a house or a, you know, any sort of living space. So, but this one here now, like my current works, which I'm working with is pretty much more like you can react to it. It's more real. So it's kind of like uh, came out from like literally from like whatever I've painted before. 
I've painted stuff like time recorders, I've painted chapoys, I've represented them in a very uh, typical artsy way, which is a painting, you know, like a typical way of like presenting art. So, but this time around, I think I'm kind of diverting myself. I want to try different things. Yeah, so. So, I mean, I think with the idea of objects as well, right? Like, the, the object itself holds a kind of power. The object itself has a kind of like gravity to it. Um, and I was just thinking about that idea of presence, right? Like, in some ways, the object has also witnessed, right? The object has yeah. also been a part of this kind of environment and therefore is able to speak, you know, maybe on its own terms. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe tell stories that other, maybe let's say paintings, haven't had that sort of invisible kind of think, thread of time to be able to tell. I mean, what do you think of all of that? Um, I think a painting is something which you, uh, which is created from a, um, like, you buy, you, you go to a stationery shop, you go get a bunch of brushes, you get a bunch of paint, you get a canvas, and then you come back home and you like, you know, you sit down, you contemplate, you think, and probably you sketch first before what you want to paint. Uh, but for me now, this is like, it's pretty spontaneous because the object is already there, it's pre present. And how am I going to like kind of repurpose this? How am I going to like reconfigure this? How am I going to recontextualize this? And uh, that, that thing kind of like, um, I have a lot of fun with that kind of stuff because I get to um, play around, you know, it's very spontaneous and it's very intuitive as well at the same time. And I think my imagination kind of like I can let it let loose like you know you can just create whatever you want because at, at the same time it kind of that particular object has that meaning or that representation you know so if you can speak you can it will tell you that you know this is what I was and this is where I was kept and you know now I'm like this yeah questions impressions uh, how do you see this piece specifically existing like beyond like this, this exhibition, like after the exhibition, will you kind of keep it in a new place or reconfigure yeah. so, it? So just for people who can't hear, uh, Amanda's question was how does she see, how do you see the piece sort of living on beyond this exhibition? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, after this exhibition, I think it's going to go to my studio. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to clock in and clock out every day. So it's, it's going to be used. So it's definitely going to be used and... Uh, Very on Kawara of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, that's, that's the... That's the Taiwanese artist, right? No, yeah. yeah Japanese artist, yes. Uh, Taiwanese? Taiwanese, yeah, right? Taiwanese, Taiwanese yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, mm. so, yeah, it'll be definitely utilized, it'll be used and, uh, in my studio. So, um, and the chapoy as well, like, I've, I've slept on it, like, you know, I used it in my studio as well. It's like a day bed. So, uh, everything in my collection of stuff which I've, like, hoarded over the years. Uh, definitely will be utilized in a, one way or another, you know. Yeah, so I, I don't waste things, like I don't throw away stuff, so I kind of keep, even though the little piece of wood which I've cut from another piece of wood is kept, because you never know when you're going to like reuse it or you, you never know when that little piece would fit somewhere, you know, yeah. So, I mean, I guess the line between being a hoarder and being an archivist is very thin. <laughs> it's very thin, yeah, because my mom complains, because uh, I kind of use her house like, as well for storing stuff and she's always kind of nagging at me like why do you keep bringing rubbish in and why do you keep bringing old wood termite eaten wood and stuff I said like I told her like this is part of your history as well because she grew up in San Saolin as well you know so she lived in the same environment in the same factory as me as well since, he were, since they were kids like her siblings and all so I told her this is part of your history as well and why do you want to chuck it away and she's like uh, no, you know, it's just it's dirty, you know, it's dusty and it's just, you know, it's an eyesore. So, but for me, it's not. Uh, for me, it's something which is very valuable, which I think my loved one has touched, like my grandparents have touched and have owned, have kept things in. And so, yeah. But I think the appreciation level between an individual is different. You know, some people like new things. Some people like old things. I like pretty much any, any, anything and everything old. So, um, but, <laughs> yeah. Questions, anyone? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that a lot of your artworks actually tied back to Chan Saolin. And because of uh, a lot of overdevelopment and stuff, for yourself, how do you wish the Chan Saolin is like now? Do you think it's overdeveloped or 
Oh, it's you totally think they should? It's so gentrified. Yeah. So yeah. how do you wish it should it should be that it actually fit? your expectation of development, maybe more adaptive views on the old buildings and stuff. How do you oh, wish it Yeah, is? so for everyone else, so the question was like, how would you, I guess, ideally sort of see Chan Sao Lin being redeveloped or, you know, being kind of like brought into our new age, right? Going back to what Leon was saying about that, way, making that wave of change. I obviously would want things the way it was before. You know, I wanted the same environment again, but sadly, you know, development is progress, as they say. So uh, for me, I think I don't like that progress because you kind of wipe out a, like a whole chunk of history of that environment, of that space. And I think Chan Sao Lin is a very special place, I think in KL, which was like kind of neglected over the years. But I think in the early uh, 19th century and towards like, you know, when during the Tao Kees, who had their mining establishments and you know, all these really rich Chinese people kind of like, uh, grew their businesses there and they kind of like really wanted to develop that place they wanted to have schoolings they want to have like proper water irrigation system and it's like it's a whole different uh, like uh, I think it was their system of their own they had their own politics and all that stuff as well but uh, over time of course uh, you know after independence uh, a lot of the old Chinese uh, businessmen kind of left and I think this, the next generation, they don't want to continue what their parents did. You know, they don't want to like make timber, uh, like vertical sawmills for, for you know, they don't want to make molds for parts for that. They, want to, they don't want to like have a workshop or something like that. You know, they want to be more professional, they want to work in offices, they want to do this. So a lot of the old businesses have been sold. And now I think Chan Saolin has become like a more of an automotive hub at the moment. So there's a lot of showrooms really clean, swanky, and there's a lot of like, I mean, there's bars popping up right now. So which is quite weird for me because I, I was there since I was one until, like I still used to often visit my grandparents. Like she, she kind of moved out from there in 2003. So I was like frequently going back and forth. And um, yeah, of course the change now I see is just like, uh, it's horrendous. I, I don't like it at all. It's like, it's hard, and, and yeah. I guess as a follow-up question, right? Would you call your works nostalgic? It is pretty much, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's something which I, I wanted to like, like say through my work. You know, it's like to represent that nostalgia. Yeah. So. Uh, cool. Questions, thoughts, impressions. Yeah. Uh, so why do you choose to pay homage to your community and grandparents through the team of work? Uh, why not sort of like objects of like, uh, I don't know, like cooking, familial, uh, no, you know, because, stuff like that? No, uh, because for me, um, I think, why my family? Uh, why, why am I paying homage to my family? Yeah, or my, or, or, you chose sort of like objects, mm -hmm. I think the themes of work, mm -hmm. uh, like labor. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think... For, for my experience, my grandparents, and also I think there's a lot of people nowadays as well have like multiple jobs, you know, so they have uh, to kind of survive. And I think back in the day it was quite similar as well. My grandparents, like, they came from India, I think in the 1940s. And my grandpa was like a civil servant uh, in the government. Uh, this was before independence. And I think the British rule was still around. And the British were still around, I think, yeah. So. Uh, like during like the day he works for the government and during the night you know you come back home which is a factory and you know, you're, you're gonna get paid to, to live there you kind uh, you can raise a family there you know you can like, do so many things so I wanted to wanted these objects to kind of represent that culture around Chan Sao Lin because uh, normally uh, Sikh families uh, those days either you're a policeman or either your your watchman, or you know, unless if your family has money, you send your kids to be doctors or lawyers, you know, something more professional. But uh, for me, I think this was more. Uh, I think the the contradicting part of being a Punjabi, kind of being a Sikh in Malaysia back in the day, was like pretty much, you know, represented this. Yeah, and I think that's also like an interesting slippage that happens, right? with the idea of work and the artwork, which is also at work. Um, and 
you know what, I, this is my sort of thoughts and feel free to disagree or jump in, but you know, to me almost I think that's this instinct to turn the gallery into a kind of factory. You know, that's an instinct to turn the gallery into a factory of art, of meaning making, of kind of imbuing it with the cultural gravity that these objects otherwise wouldn't have. Right, like the, the gallery almost becomes a kind of like processing, processing station. Um, it's like you get put here, you have meaning, and then you leave, and you're like suddenly like super powerful, right? <laughs> um, so I, there's a kind of there's a kind of awareness of that cultural uh, relevance that's at play, which I don't think is unlike what a lot of people like architects do when they make sort of preservations for their buildings, right? When they when it undergoes a kind of like shiny little scrubbing, and at the other end, it's history, right? Um, yeah. Thoughts, feelings, impressions? Yeah. Well, I guess we can move on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, on to the next one, which is Chung Yen's. Uh, I'll you. walk. Oh, okay. Cool. Nice. All right, okay. Hi guys, so Chong Yen here. Hi everyone. So the work, in case you didn't know, because I didn't know, is pronounced at Acus, right? <laughs> so uh, it's Atlas, you know, that is shortened to at, and then uh, Acus means equal in Latin, right? So it's his latest world building project um, that is this kind of endless exploration game where users traverse these many, many spaces that constitute a bigger at Aquas universe. So at Aquas draws from a five-fold conception of Wu Xing, which is a Chinese theory of like the five phases. So you have wood, you have fire, you have earth, metal, and water. And all of this governs and explains all the interactions between phenomena, from politics to medicine to you know, the way in which we interact with the world around us. So, trained as an architect, a lot of Chong Yen's work is sort of imagines architecture in a digital world, right? Uh, I mean, I think even beyond that, a kind of virtual world, right? It asks what the role an architect should play in a fully virtual future. And I, I mean, there's this one line that Chong Yen told me that always sticks with me. It's like, what if you could design not just an environment, but a kind of meta god, right? And as the physical becomes increasingly tied to other interfaces, so you know, thinking about like the way in which we scan the QR codes or like our phones that kind of interact with both physical and sort of virtual space, or even 3D renderings, right, during the pandemic when you're seeing art exhibitions that are sort of in these sort of very janky 3D spaces. So it, it almost feels like, to me at least, this work is that logic of the virtual push to the extreme. And I think it's very interesting to put your work in conversation with the two before because uh, where Davinda's work kind of references an interface to world, right? The gallery is an interface, the gallery is a kind of like processor. Uh, here, you're taking it almost like 10 times further and you're like, okay, let's dive fully in into this virtual created world um, and, and it's in a kind of like simulation, right? So it's, it's almost beyond digital at this point, right? And I think, you know, beyond the normal kind of like, you know, the virtual world is taking over and that's why we kind of have to explore it. What potential do you see in working in the virtual? Like, what is it for, for you that really draws you in? Mm, the virtual environment. I think that's where we kind of lie in, right? Like, I, I always... The whole project kind of started with... Um, as a kid growing up, like, pretty much like um, what my my parents always do, it's like, mm -hmm. there's this period of time, this, it's called like Bai mm -hmm. Bai Tian Kong, which is the, the day where you pray to the sky god, right? But what's interesting is I used to hear story from my grandfather, like, about how they pray to the sky god. They used to lay, lay out this really long, like, you know, five meters long sort of like table. And it's like three story high. The higher you are and the, you put food on it, the higher you are, the closer you are to the god or the sky god. So that's quite interesting. It always stuck in my mind, like you know, like how how this sort of like world would be as a kid growing up. It's like what what are you offering to you know? How does the the world of the sky god like environment is like you know? So and then it kind of come to the idea of like social media world or the digital reality that we all live in. You know, um, I think I'm in the generation where we kind of go through this transitional generation from the playground world to like um, more of a I guess social media environment, right? Like, you know, first we 
we started representing ourselves in the digital environment from the 2D environment where, you know, uh, like a 2D interface of a Facebook and Instagram and all these things to like more of a 3D environment, which we kind of drop into um, right now. And then we kind of go into the idea of the meta environment, which is the near future, right? Like, so our reality are being more represented in a more 3D environment uh, in the near future, I think. Like, yeah. <laughs> And I guess for you, like, what's the role of an architect in all of that? Like, why is architecture still relevant if, you know, there are no more buildings? I think it's quite interesting because, like, the role of an architect holds quite a lot of power, right? So, right now, where we are in, in the Web2 environments, like, you know, we are always representing ourselves in the digital social media and curating our digital identity online, right? So, when... It goes into the 3D environment, the architect holds a lot of power to design the, the world of the meta on us, um, and that will affect social behavior and how we behave on this, the space, right? The architect almost holds the position of the digital shaman in a way, or like has a lot of understanding of techno paganism and all these things, right? So he, he or she, the architect or the creator, holds the power to design all the hidden Easter egg of the world, you know? Like he, he or she like knows every single like you know gateway and east blueprint and hidden like charms or like point based quantification of like social behavior of the world as well so it's interesting where the role of an architect like you know cannot evolve in the near future how is it going to be in the digital environment architect can hold a lot of power to design a digital like i guess like social media environment for our way of life and our digital reality i think yeah any architects in the room? Any thoughts, impressions, feelings? Yeah, you can also feel free to pick up the controller. Yeah, so I yeah. think the uh, best thing is I can bring you on the journey throughout the whole game and then I'll kind of share as I go along. Um, yeah? yeah, yeah, we can do this little short tour. Alrighty. Let's do this. Nice. Great. Feel free to come in, guys. Yeah, feel, yeah, free. feel free to ask any question as I kind of go around the... So we start off with the first map, which is a labyrinth of acres. It's based on the Chinese Wu Jing, right? Where the main map has like five different doors that leads you to different elemental map. You know, coming from Sui Huo Jing Mu Tu, which is like a uh, Sui Water, Huo Fire, Jing, uh, Matter, Mu Wood, and uh, obviously Soil or Earth. Um, pick one element, anyone? Like, sui Huo Sui. Okay, let's go to Water first. Um, so this is Labyrinth of Acres, the main map. I'll show you. This. <laughs> I'll show you some Easter egg as well, so that uh, uh, you can kind of enjoy. Maybe you can show us death as well. Yeah, death as well. Yeah, I'll make it as good as I can. So the first Easter egg is here. Um, Here it has four doors. Uh, the middle one's earth. I'll pick one of it. So like the water door would be this one. Uh, no, not this. This one. So the blue represents water. Yeah, so you see all the lights are blue right now. So this is the world created by the blue meta, like all the water meta gods. So we have a question here. Yep. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Can you share about your process of producing this piece? Sorry? Can you share about your process of producing this piece and how much time it takes? Okay, so the question is share the process of creating this place and how much time it takes. 
Uh, so the process, it took around like six months to create a game like this. But it's quite interesting because like, as a digital artist, you tend to quantify things, right? So a lot of the things that you see are all numbers, right? For example, like a reflection can has, you know, we, we try to quantify things. How do you create a material like this? It's like a diffuse index of like zero, a reflective index of 30, you know, like, so everything is basically numbers in my mind. When I look at reality as well, I try to quantify reality and try to mimic reality. How do you actually create it digitally, I think? Uh, yeah. But yeah, a total of six months. So it started off with like kind of a drawing. I started drawing like blueprints and maps of the world that led up to the creation of this, uh, this game. Anyone else have questions? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, um, why did you pick this for your artwork, basically? Yeah. So the question here: Why did you choose to represent this for your artwork, Chongyan? Sorry. Why did you choose this in particular to represent for your work? Like, you mean a, a like why video you, of a game? Yeah. Oh, like one point is just like. You know, why you pick element for your artwork? Why elements? Yeah, why, why elements? the elements? It's, um, I guess it's like quite interesting. It's like the, I like the idea of like one, one subject, right? Can explain multiple elements. It's like an allegory, right? Um, Wu Jing, you know, like the fire element. And it's quite interesting, the hyperlinkage between every element. If let's say I'm an element of a fire, you're an element of water, we don't vibe with each other, but through the mediator of the soil, it's only we can speak to each other, right? It's that kind of interconvergence, interconnecting and all these things. So that's what I use the structure of the Wuting to design the, the game. I mean, the, pretty much the, the kind of like, the structure of every gateway of the game. So if you go on to the plan view of the game, it represents every single, like, uh, I guess like, yeah, so if you look from the top, like for every single map, it, it represents something, you know, in the Wu Ting kind of drawing. And that's quite interesting, I guess, like, um, because like, yeah, like, um, I like the idea of something quite poetic, something so simple, but you can use it for like all sort of things, right? From medicine to like astrology to like, you know, calculate where your life's gonna be in the next couple of years and things like that. But also I really like the idea of like blueprints, right? So, you know, for example, how do you actually draw a map of something that's not um, being drawn? For example, like how do you draw a mythical world? You know, when, if you look at old Tibetan maps as well, they are very, they're all represented by a very kind of anagram looking or like um, a very beautiful sort of like, you know, um, symbol symbol to represent what what the world is right because you don't have a you know a door in in the world because you're dropping in from a third of fourth dimension you know so i think that's quite nice to think about it same goes for a game you know you can literally like for example there's an easter egg here by falling through here you know i hope oh, maybe not and try again <laughs> yeah see like by going through that like i i just appear elsewhere without opening a door you know so um yeah, that's why Wuting is quite nice as well. It's like, you know, a symbol that represents gateways without having a floor plan of a door, you know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, oh, that's we a... had one more question, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hi. I love the graphics and, and the music and all. It's very Dune and very 2049-ish. Uh, uh, but, I, but I have a, a Blade Runner. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, first of all, do you plan to, you know, sell this game on Steam or something? So Seconds. I think that's the thing. So uh, oh, there's another question. Sorry. That's a, uh, oh. hey, one more. <laughs> what's the other question? Ah, what's the objective of the game? Because we are so like you know uh, bogged down always by the you know because it's a game yeah. there must be an objective and end goal. But do you think is there an end goal for this game? Let's let's say I wouldn't say it's a game per se, but it's more like a poetic journey. You know, like um, yeah, because this is more like a meta environment. Think about it as me being as part of the exhibition. You know, I'm part of the world, you know, but you, you kind of speculate about where our future is going to be, right? Um, that's how our reality is going to be represented in the digital environment, right? Like, you know, instead of using like Facebook, Instagram and all these things, this is where we are going to be socializing with our friends, you know, but obviously through the VR lens or like through the AR lens and things like that, you know. And in terms of like 
where this game is going next. Um, perhaps, yeah, Steam, Steam could be nice. Uh, but my idea is like, I want to probably like, raise a fund to be able to host it on uh, Pixel Streaming. Uh, so I can cast it directly onto the HTML website and anyone can just enjoy it by going to www.acres.io. You know, they will be able to play it directly. So yeah, that's... Uh, I think the space isn't only like confined in the game, it also extends to where we are. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, yeah. Sorry, if you guys didn't hear, Dennis said uh, the space isn't just confined to the game, but it also kind of extends to where we are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one second, this is the mic. Um, so for all these spaces, like fire, water and stuff, how, what is your inspiration to design like each space? Why does it look like this for like fire or water? Yeah, so the question oh. was, what's the inspiration behind designing each individual space? And I will say one thing, when I sort of saw the game at first, it felt to me like it was very much built from the kind of like, outside like inside out almost like you know you kind of start with a certain asset and then you kind of like tessellate that asset and then it multiplies right there's a kind of level of that math thinking that you were talking about but chung in i don't know it's a it's a weird one like this is like you know an artist painting on a canvas they always start with a blank canvas right but for me it's like this is my canvas this is what i'm used to right so i always start with Imagine the world is all empty, right? They're all just like wireframe and empty. That's how I kind of sculpt things. You start with just a sphere, right? You know? And yeah, you just express your feelings. So I was thinking of, let's say, the element of fire, you know? What do I feel if I encapsulate the, the identity of the fire? Then that's the word that pours out of my, myself, I guess. So I, I can't really like tell you how I, why things are done in a certain way and why, why the war of the fire look a certain way. It's just um, something quite, yeah, it's imagination, digital imagination, right? It comes out of your soul, um, yeah. I have one question for you as well. So, I mean, ACUS has a kind of double meaning. So it means equality, but it also means flat, right? It means horizontal. And I think with the game, there's a, it is a kind of all-consuming totality. Right, like it's it's very whole. It's a kind of closed loop system. Uh, it has its own system for like physics and time and space and all that. And I think that sets up a very interesting way to view your work. I mean, users can walk around and they can interact with the work, but they can't necessarily enact their own agency in like making own worlds, right? So do you think, I mean, in a kind of like totalitarian world, is this how you see? the virtual, you know, our relationship to the virtual ending up? Yeah, it's a, it's a weird one, you know, because the world we live in right now, our real, digital reality are being held by just like, you know, one powerful or two couple of powerful individual, right? They are, you know, the, the one that runs all the social media platform, but it can be quite a dark future as well, you know, I would say, like, you think about where our privacy are being exploited right now and our data are being, you know, exploited, right? Like, through using or through representing ourselves digitally, but in the near future, like, when we are all representing ourselves through this meta-human in the 3D virtual environment, yeah, when you're kind of like recrafting who you are online, like, how do you actually protect yourself, I think? Like, yeah, like, and it's, it's a dystopic kind of landscape, I guess. It can be quite dystopic because I can, in a kind of sub-speculative sub scenario, I can, I can imagine everyone just sitting at home with their VR goggles and not going out and just, you know, because... When you can sort of like, I think the question lies in when you can sit on the rocket and fly out to Mars, you know, like, will you do, do that when it's more dangerous or will you sit at home and have the same exact like kind of expression and emotion, the feeling when you're flying out to Mars through like, you know, technology and through virtual kind of environment, right? Like, do you think your work's an omen? Omen? Mm. <laughs> I, I, not an omen, I, I don't know, but I like the idea of like future myth, right? Like all mythology, because the mythology that we are kind of like, the stories that we hear today isn't like relevant to our time, you know, like myths are always created through generation and generation. So I would like to think like how people would think of this work like, you know, 100 years from now, you know, when everyone is stuck in that virtual environment, like what would this work be, you know, maybe it could be like quite, quite an interesting one um, to look into, like, it won't be, I'm pretty much crafting future artifacts and future, a myth for the future, you know, to kind of inform future lineage of what world building project could be, I guess, like, yeah. Do you want to show us yeah. death? 
Oh, um, Daffy, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm not sorry so to speak to it. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I'm going to project now. I, I have a question. You said that you thought about how your work might be perceived in 100 years, but I'm actually more interested in the very near future where everyone's sort of thinking about a kind of social aspect, you know, that creates metaverse, which, which sort of basically allows that social layer into digital realms and environments. Just kind of curious, have you actually also created um, your game or virtual environments and put it on these platforms where you allow other people to populate or come into that universe? So yeah, it's more like, uh, definitely I was thinking, that's a kind of a mini, what you call a roadmap, I guess. So that's the first stage, right? So at the time being, Ilham has the, I guess they have the right to own the work for the next six months. But after six months, when I reach the fund, I'll host it on HTML5, which is like, it's going to be pixel stream on the web page. But I'll encapsulate code that everyone can create their own avatar and populate the world. I think that's quite interesting to look into. Um, to see how people behave or how, what sort of like, I'm curious to know like what sort of like, what, what are people drawn into, right? Like what sort of like universe. And this is not my first game that I designed. It's, um, I create words, that's what I do as an artist, right? So this is the fourth word that I created. And the next one will be the fifth word. By the end of the fifth word, I'll combine all the world, all the meta environment into one entire, you know, a big kind of universe, you know? Um, so you do see your artwork, which is, you know, what you have created to be sort of populated and used yeah, by other totally. people in a kind of functional, more yeah. That's whatever. That's the ideal right. scenario to see how people interact with the space, right? Because like the, as a role of the architect, we design spaces, but also like I'm curious to see how people would, you know, as a kind of like collective manifestation of like the society, how do they get get together and use the space to create it or like make make themselves home in this environment, you know? So it could be like a blueprint that lets them add things into the world or like populate the world, you know. That be that be quite a interesting collective driven like world building uh, stuff to look into. Yeah. Uh, just along the line of that, I feel like if you're trying to get people to like repopulate it, it'd be kind of interesting to look at the governance structures that they may use. Mm. Or how would you how would you try and so like, the question uh, for those who didn't hear it's about you know what kind of governance structures would could be incorporated like what is the, the structure of the world in which you're building? It reminded me of like the first like sort of like online game that took off. It's called Second Life. I'm not sure whether you heard about it like back in the days, right? So a good way to think about it is humanity are given a chance to recreate what humanity is, you know, on the kind of Second Life environment. But it turns out to be like, in the end, it kind of flows into what our capitalist society is like, you know. You know? Um, so, yeah, like, government structure, as a role of an architect, we don't create the government structure. It's all down to, like, the people, you know, that goes into the world. Because there's no kind of body that controls the law of the digital environment and the meta environment, right? So it's more like everyone holds their own, I guess when the Web3 com kind of comes in, everyone holds their own, like, power to influence how society is going to be on a digital environment, I think. Yeah, yeah like it's because um, you can't really like misbehave on the digital environment. I, I guess you can, you know, but there's no kind of structure that holds how people behave online, you know. I, mean, I think yes and no, right? Yeah. There's a sort of corporations who hold, let's say, a certain amount of bandwidth, like yeah. kind of do exert their influence and therefore also have a kind of larger say in governance, but I guess digital parallels life, right? Like, and the question is, as an individual, like what agency can you really enact? And maybe in a world that is yet more pliable, more malleable, less sort of set, there maybe is a little bit more room for that. I mean, yes. would, would you agree? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, cause that's the thing, the environment in the near future, we don't want to wake up every day and wear our AR glasses and next thing we see is a floating Coca-Cola sign like floating out your window, right? So the domain of the meta environment is, um, yeah, like it's going to be relatively the same thing, you know, like companies going to take out the meta environment and hold like power over it. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we have one more question. 
<laughs> um, I don't really know how to word this, but I've been hearing some voiceovers, and I was just wondering if there are random words or if there are things people have said to you that resonate with you. So the question was about voiceovers and whether or not, and basically what yeah. they are and you know where they come from. So I think this work is in collaboration with an AI. So I created you know a couple of AI in my past, but um, I use uh, Open AI for mainly the generation of the narrative, right? So her name is Skylar, and she's like creating the voice over for the the world, right? Including like I use uh, this thing called generative pre-transformer. It's GPT. It's a language learning model. So. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting that er everyone plays a game and have a different story. Every 10 minutes, it will generate a story as well. So it's quite, quite fun to listen to that. Yeah. So I don't know what story is going to come out of it as well. Yeah. Yeah? OK. Uh, I'm interested in the language of your world. Yeah. Uh, is your typography a distorted version of Chinese characters or uh, is it actually, because I've seen your previous exhibitions as well, is yeah. it the same language? Or? Yeah, so it's the same language, so that's what I do, right? Um, it's actually the second word that I created called 27 Years of Lazarin Delights. I play the role of the, the explorer going on a journey and as part of that, the, ex the exploration, I learned a language called yeah, Codex, you know, but I've been writing my own language for the past, I think, six years now. And yeah, it's kind of like always scattered around all the bodies and the landscape of the universe. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is death. <laughs> so this is death, yeah. So this is actually a, you know, a five meters long like, drawing that I did. Um, it's kind of like, it re represent like, the kind of outer tablecloth of uh, you know, like the Pai Tian Gong, which is the yeah, print. Oh uh, yeah, so that's the, the AI generating the story right now. Like, um, yeah, in a nutshell, that's pretty much it. But anyways, if you want to see the drawing, I'm doing a, another exhibition next week. Again, you can see the physical piece. Uh, it will be at, uh, follow my Instagram, and then I'll post something there next weekend. Cool. All right, let's move on to Minstrel's work, which is over there. All right, all right, gather around, guys. This, feel free to step behind it, around it. There's no front, there's no back, you know. Uh, <laughs> It's a nice little circle. All right, so we end with Minstrel Quick. Uh, Minstrel's work, I think to me, has no clear summary. So I'm going to attempt what I can, but I think as the conversation develops, you know, we'll sort of develop our understanding of the work together. So the work is composed of different images and objects that are drawn from different histories, right? So uh, that image there is uh, by German photographer Kleingrosser. Uh, picturing the deforestation of Malaya in the early 1900s. Uh, in early 1900s. Uh, but also, a lot of the images here are all built from Minstrel's own photography practice, right? So, you know, the Duran images, especially, I think, are really sort of powerful to me. Um, but I think what really matters, for me at least, is, is the involvement, right? Is the entanglement. Uh, what happens in the kind of structure that holds it all together. So this work is built out of a whole other series uh, that had the exhibition title Memory Games of a House in Motion, right? So uh, like, Div like Davinda, I think you kind of have this urge to archive and to kind of narrate the past. But you also very have, have a very strong urge to transform these materials um, that, you're be that you're presented with. So I think to me that really speaks to this act of making memory evident, right? Uh, in the space of the house, you know, to work with the kind of changing subjectivity of yourself as you also sort of change with the world. I mean, with the A-frame, you know, you're kind of literally making space, right? Uh, there's a lightness in the fabric, but also, and, and with the structure and how it kind of sits on the ground, but also there is a sense of it being weighed down, right? There's a, the, when fabric drapes, you know, it kind of like, it kind of falls and, and gravity is, is made evident. Um, the form is kind of never fixed, but I think what I sort of see here is a commitment to kind of remaking again and again and again, um, which speaks to the title of the work, which is A House in Motion, Repair, Restore, Reimagine and Rebuild. So uh, Amanda and I were talking yesterday, but, you know, moving on from Chong Yen's work to here, like fabric is almost this, the halfway point of the physical and the digital, right? Um, the warp and weft kind of necessitates this very like 
gridded thinking, almost like the pixel or the kind of binary of the one and zero. And as someone who uses Photoshop, like these client growth images have obviously been manipulated as well as your own uh, photography archive in the past. You know, and then printing the work on fabric. What do you see in this interaction between working on the screen and then sort of printing it onto fabric? Um, and do you even think that's important in like kind of fabric thinking, right? I think we are dealing with something very abstract mm. because, uh, I mean, in our everyday uh, experience or uh, encounters, we are demanded to uh, shift gears uh, because because we are living in an environment and uh, I don't know uh, I don't feel like talking right now because I'm too emotional <laughs> uh, because of all the works uh, you know that uh, artists who, uh, who have been sharing with us as if uh, you know we are invited to experience so so many stories uh, going through different ages going through different spaces so uh, right now I'm very uh, I don't feel like talking Do you because want to sit on the ground? Do we all want to sit? It's very emotional <laughs> But at the same time, I mean I mean looking at Chong Yen's work and because I'm also a great fan of uh, science fiction And yeah, I would like to share with you a a, a, a story I, I read when I was a teenager, when I was still in my hometown. So there, there was a column in the newspaper called like a window of the world, something like that. So one day I discovered a story. I'm, the reason why I say story is because I cannot verify whether it's true or not, you know. So in that story, uh, they said scientists found chips in, uh, you know, in human body. So uh, like we are programmed in a way, like, like we are, you know, biological cyborg, that kind of things. And when I read that story, I was very excited because I said, oh, finally I have this answer, you know, like, oh, I'm a cyborg, but, you know, I'm a human cyborg, I'm a biological cyborg. And it helps me to unlock a lot of things, including how I think, how I feel, how I see. So, in a way, at can you imagine that I'm an AI talking to you right now? Or you are an AI yourself? You know, like... So, so going back to your question just now, you know... Yeah, the reason why, you know, from one space, why I shift from one space to, to another, I mean... I think the only purpose is to make sure that I see what I see or I feel what I feel. But at the same time, I know that I don't see what I see, I don't feel what I feel. But that is not important. Yeah, because, uh, because what's in what is the most important is in the process and the meaning of process is to 
going back to what Chong Yen said just now, he, he kept repeating, you know, uh, holding the power. Yeah, holding the power. <laughs> so I'm an AI imitating what I just saw and heard, you know. I remember words. I remember stories. I remember what I saw. So those experiences, I have internalized them and then they become my memories. But that is not enough because I think there are different levels of memories. And in order to make those memories mine, I think I have to I have to, you know, see memory as a space or I mean you, you can relate to what I say now with Chong Yen's work, but I'm not going to give you a world. I'm not a god, you know, because I'm only AI. I'm not creator, you know. <laughs> but I think the, the yeah, the, the, the agency is to to accept that I'm an AI, but try to feel the feeling, you know, try to learn how to feel. Yeah. Do you think memory is burdensome? It could be, yeah. It could be because, uh, I mean, memory is information. Like Chong Yen said, uh, he only sees numbers, you know. It, it's very strange because uh, because it requires translation. When you change space, spaces from one to another, like from one language to another, from one space to another, from one temperature to another. In our, yeah. So, but at the same time, it's important and it's not important. Yeah, I, you know, like, have you seen uh, Blade Runner 1 and 2, you see? So they, Basically, you know, the, the, the girl in the lab, you know, he, he, she cannot go out and she programmed all her childhood memories into different, you know, people. And these people carry, actually carry her memory. And I don't know, yeah. Is the body like a kind of house for memory, do you think? In that way? The body, the house, uh, the memory. I, I wouldn't say it's the house, but... Uh, or maybe memory is the house. You know, it is like uh, yeah. That's why I say memory is the, is the space. If we tend to think, you know, uh, like you ask Chong Yuan, what is the role of an architect in the metaverse? Yeah. So yeah, it, it it's all about our perception of space, whether it's real or not real. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, but definitely we are making something, we are creating something and we are experiencing something, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last time we talked about the work, you're saying how your process very much is like a hard drive, everything is labeled, it's time stamped, and you kind of start, the starting point is kind of this archive, all this a mix of found imagery, but also your own imagery. And when you think about time or you think about the work, 
do you like how long is this for is it for something to be like like this is a memory because if you think about like what i'm saying right now three seconds ago what i just said is a memory so what is the time frame do you set like errors like i want to work with work from 10 years ago or like five years ago or from like two minutes ago so what is like the time frame in which you like to think about memory and work and the idea of like repurposing and recollecting I think it's a matter of chance and when I, I talk about chance it's really chance is something that will set time free because it doesn't follow an order a sequence so I, I you know, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for a sign, <laughs> like waiting for God, <laughs> waiting for a sign. And uh, yeah, most of the time in my process, I know that a lot of you, you are interested in knowing, you know, process. Most of the time I'm, I read, I, it, it just like we eat, you know, we, we experience things, we work, or. Uh, uh, I collect images, I look at my images, uh, I touch materials, I, I try to unlock my memories, you know, try to recall something, you know, in a type of like sleeping mode in my, you know, the, the back of my memories. And then I wait. <laughs> I have to wait. I have to wait for... Uh, I, I, I think at the end I have to forget, yeah, like put myself in a like a kind of like hypnose kind of a mode, and then is when I, you know, when I forget what I know, and then the the new things, a new time will emerge. It, it's very strange, but but time is. It's not linear, so so we can always go back, jump in and out, like uh, like teleportation, something like that, or in and out. But I don't know uh, because now we are we are so we are so into you know technologies, a uh, digital world. But actually, we are doing that, you know. Uh, we, we can do it now, you know, like, that's why we meditate, but I don't med meditate. Yeah, so in meditation, maybe I just imagine because I don't, I don't meditate. I also don't meditate. <laughs> you know, but uh, like how literature or any kind of things can trigger, you know, uh, an emotion, memory, whether it's your memory, memory or collective memory, yeah. But I'm not sure the relationship yet, you know, whether memory is in time or time is in memory. But I don't know. So yeah, because your practice as well, you know, is like, but, but you see, it's like a fabric, going back to the fabric. There are multiple lines, and then we can cross those lines and you, you form a plane. But at the same time, the plane, you can, you know, yeah, shape it into a different surfaces. So, so there, there are multitude of uh, worlds, you know, of times. Yeah. Multiverse. Yeah, that's it. You know, <laughs> Uh, Chong Yen mentioned about his Buddhist upbringing, uh, Taoist upbringing. So our experience with time is very strange, you know, like if, you know, the, the word tradition, in a way, it, it means time, you know, like a kind of like stagnant time, you know, not changing time, not changing our practices. Uh, but we know that we, we change. So, so that, that kind of uh, uh, interrelationship of change and, uh, and stillness is what 
make our, you know, our experience so, so real. Do you feel transformed by the work or by making work? Uh, do I feel like transformed? It, it happened very slowly, very, very slowly. Like if I look at my works in my early 20s or if I recall, I try to recall. I imagine that I can recall, but sometimes maybe those are not my memories. Uh, can you share a bit about your process of creating art, right? How it supports you in finding out all these questions that you have in mind? Like you, you have a, a lot of uh, 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 thoughts about different factors of life, elements of life, and how is the process of uh, the practice of creating arts actually uh, complement along with this part of uh, you? Sorry, what was the last part of your question? Uh, so you, you create art, right? So how did this practice of uh, making art uh, work along with you uh, having all kinds of uh, thoughts and questions about different things about life? So uh, for everyone else, it's, I guess, about the relationship between art and life, right? Yeah. Art and life. You mentioned about memory, times, mm -hmm. all kind of things, right? A lot of questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when I was still an art student, you know, I read uh, what Joseph Boyce said about, you know, everyone can be artists. And, or he mentioned about social sculpture. I think when we say everyone is an artist, let's say, what, what does it mean? Or when we say, uh, my grandfather used to have this object, what does it mean? You know, like, it doesn't mean anything actually, unless you engage in that process of making. It's just like, I don't take it for granted that when I look at something or when I hear something, I will feel something, you know, or there are different levels of feeling. So because I'm a AI, so I'm learning, I'm learning to like try to locate my feeling or locate my knowledge in you know in very abstract spaces you know whether it's a physical world or whether it's a metaphysical world yeah so art and life i think i would yeah i, I live for art yeah but uh yeah, Be because uh, it's much more fun, yeah, that way, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Thoughts, <laughs> no, I, I like the works uh, when they are displayed here because they appear much smaller comparing uh, with uh, my studio and here they look like play yeah they yeah it's almost like a like a toy yeah in a way mm -hmm. do you make this for the scale of your body for a child's body like do you think about who's on the other side I think most of the time I, I work with a, a certain type of limitation, whether it's economical or, or uh, a given circumstances or uh, found objects. In this case, would be 
uh, the, the wooden structures I have in my studio. And, uh, and then, I, you know, when chances come or present, then it, it is a negotiation or is an exchange. Yeah. So, and then little by little, I realized that, oh, yeah, I, I want to make something like a, a dollhouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't appear at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, yeah. For me, it looks like, for me, it looks like the textile loom, uh -huh. uh, the structure of it. So I guess that's something that, you know, I, I thought of. La. Yeah. yeah. You work with fabrics and, you know, textile, fabrics slash textile. So the idea of the sort of triangularness of the structure reminds me of a textile loom. Uh, I just bought four. Oh, wow. <laughs> From Shopee. <laughs> but they are still in the boxes, you know. And Shell, you have a loom, right? I used to. I, mean, I used yeah, to. I used to so weave, she yeah. knows better uh, about waving. But yeah, I don't, I'm not a, yeah, I don't know how to wave. But, uh, but the, yeah, definitely the, the concept itself or how, it, be, because now you know, on Instagram, you can find different sort of structure. Sometimes it's very easy. You can simply have a, you know, a structure and then, you, you, you just, you know, wrap the, the, the threads, uh, yeah, and then you can, it, it just uh, X and Y, actually, you know, waving is just, yeah, X and Y. If you know the structure and then, yeah, it's like, at the same time, it's like figure, you know, numbers, but how do you create flash and bone to the numbers? And then at the same time, you know that, they are only numbers, but can numbers feel? I know. It, when Chong Yen said uh, he he saw numbers, it looks sounds like you know a scene in Matrix. You know, I always uh, amaze how they when they look at the screen, they can actually see what happened. You know, you just see uh, numbers, numbers, yeah. But they they can actually pinpoint something happened in the digital or virtual world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any sort of final sorry, thoughts? I'm very oh. curious about the choice of your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not seen yet your installation work. Um, and, you know, when put next to Leon's house, which is very clean and you know, kind of like a basic, like foundational structure. Mm -hmm. Your house kind of reminds me a lot of my parents' home um, in Kapong. It's mm -hmm. like a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like too sayang to throw stuff away. So mm -hmm. you just keep. And I kind of see that here. Um, but yet at the same time, I'm really looking hard at the images. They both relate to the long history of photography, but also, you know, the kind of encounter of this region, as well as quite a number of images from Bursae. And all along, there's a lot of yellow. Um, it's just kind of curious, like, this work and its title seems to suggest that it's a quite a broken home that needs to be repaired, restored, and then reimagined and rebuilt. How much of this is... Uh, kind of maybe personal and biographical, and how much of it is actually uh, the, the home that represents the country, perhaps? Maybe you want to talk about that a bit, very curious. I think I, I would rather use a house instead of home. Okay. Yeah, because house is more, uh, it's more physical, whereas home is very emotional. Sure. And uh, house is about, the making, the building process, whereas home is like uh, yeah, it's almost it, conceptual, isn't it? It's like an idea of something. No, home is like uh, like you're always in like in the 
searching of something that is not there. Whereas house is like you are making something very concrete. Like I wouldn't say I uh, I will find home in a, a like a virtual space, but I'm making houses in a virtual space. And I mean, at this. Of course, the, the, the work uh, happened, I mean, the, uh, it was, uh, it happened in parallel with uh, the Sheraton move uh, and uh, I, I like to revisit what happened in my life and what happened in, uh, in the history. And yeah, this, this work is like revisiting what happened in the last decade in, uh, in my house and in the house of people, what happened. Uh, that, that's why, yes, it's true that uh, there's a parallel between the house of people and a more domestic house, personal house, personal space. And um, and I think what connect what connects these two houses, personal and collective, or or national, is uh, you know our sense of freedom. What define uh, the param parameters of our thinking is, uh, you know, how to grasp that sense of freedom. Yeah. And uh, I think the, the social movements happened in the last decade in Malaysia really helped Malaysians to, you know, to have a, a taste of freedom. What does it taste, you know? It's just like when you when you see when you see a color like you see red, you know. Yeah. But if you sh see different shades of red, yeah. yeah. So freedom is like different level of freedoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, our time is up. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you to Minstrel and to all the others. Uh, yeah, we'll be around for any questions, thoughts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.